Uh, Steve Brax, thanks very much for talking to Business Spectator. Very pleased to be here. Most of our viewers would be familiar with you primarily in your days as a Premier of Victoria, though uh, most recently you're, you're now actually working in a variety of roles, and often that is the case with, with former politicians, particularly if they leave when they're young enough to take on a new career uh, in other worlds, in business and non-profit. Y your style as a leader it was, very, what was seen certainly from the outside to be quite inclusive and consensual in that respect. Have you been able to transfer that when you have like a portfolio of different roles or do you simply seek to influence that style of, of leadership in where you work? Yeah, I, th I don't think you can change really and I, I guess my leadership style was well known, well understood and, um, and those that um, I've worked with in uh, post my period as Premier have really um, sought my interest or involvement in a board or in an advisory role on the basis of what my leadership style was and the basis of what I'd undertaken. So it's no different and in a sense I don't think you can, uh, um, you can, you have to be yourself, you have to uh, uh, be good at what you, um, what your, your, your case history is about and I think that's probably where um, the interest has lied in, in me being involved in, in boards. In a sense, um, you know, most boards or uh, advisory roles, they're looking for team players. They're looking for people who can contribute, who can provide insights, who can assist in direction or strategy, um, but not necessarily someone who, um, who is going to be a one-man band. So I think they're, that's what they're looking for as well. And when you come upon these boards, yeah. uh, we're looking at the range of, we work with KP KPMG, yes. you work with National Australia Bank, uh, Jardine Thompson, the insurer, yes. and these are big corporates. Yes. Well, we're looking, looking across business, often business leaders are known, uh, for want of a better word, this sort of hard style, the dictatorial style often can work in business. We see uh, well-known companies on the ASX, for instance, where the leaders hang on too long, and also you get that in politics. I is, that, is that a natural flaw of that style? Style. Well, I think it's in all walks of life. I think succession planning is a is a much underrated um, skill and quality. And certainly, I was aware of that when I was uh, premier. That you know, have re have regard for the organisation. In that case, the Australian Labor Party, the government itself, um, which the party had formed, and to uh, to have a strong organisational base, a good team, uh, to leave it in good shape, and to leave it in a way that can, um, those skilled and able people can ta take on in the future. So I think, I think succession planning is very important and very underrated. And I think, I think um, business is really understands this now. Um, you're looking at um, the longevity of corporate executives. I mean, probably Australia has one of the, the, the shortest term chief executives on average of any country in the world to mm -hmm. a large extent. So mm -hmm. um, that begs the question though, in, in moving on, is there proper and effective succession planning? And I would argue that's something that I can contribute to organisations to assist, um, to support people who might be coming up for the organisation, to mentor on occasion. I've been asked to do that, for example, within KPMG, to me mentor uh, up and coming executives who can take on bigger roles and to assist them with leadership and how to bring about change, how to um, effectively bring people with you in that journey on change. So that, that's, that's part of the, the role, I guess, too. Well, when we look at politicians mm. who br later went into business life, it's a very mixed rapport. Yeah. Now, tell me the difference between being an advisor and being on an actual board or a non-executive director on a board. Do politicians avoid that uh, or should they avoid that? Well, I think, um, I think you have to be very careful on what you get involved in and only should only get involved in something that you have a deep understanding, that you've done the effectively a due diligence on, and that you feel you can contribute in your skill base to the organisation. So that's one of the reasons I accepted the role as uh, chair of CBUS, uh, one of the large industry superannuation funds, because I, I did have a background, I did have an understanding, and I could um, uh, bring a, co a board together cohesively. Uh, to the benefit of members. So I had some skills there which I could bring to it and I knew what I was getting into. Jardine Lloyd Thompson Australia, I have a strong background in, um, in workers' compensation, in, uh, uh, in, in, in a, a range of insurance issues of which I dealt with a lot as Premier and even prior to that in the work I did before. So I think that due diligence is very important. You can achieve a fair bit by taking up an advisor role. You don't need to always be a non-executive director, an advisor to the chairman. Chairmen of boards or organisations, it's a very lonely position. Mm. 
they're looking for people that can assist as a sounding board to discuss strategy with, to discuss direction with, to get advice on the next steps. Um, and I think that's a role that someone like me in a leadership position in the past can play in the future as well. And uh, so my recommendation to, to people who are moving on, looking at for other opportunities or a portfolio of interest is to look carefully. Some people have come to grief by picking organisations or they've picked for them, which look, um, on the face of it, uh, robust and sound, but not during the due diligence have come to some difficulty. And what is that process? I once, uh, yeah. I once talked to Ray McSharry, who was a former European commissioner, had yes. come back and he was looking for directorships. Um, he took an unusual directorship and he said that his process was he took the first six that came to him. Uh, I'm not sure that's pretty unusual, but, but, but at a certain point you do take a risk. Let's say insurance, for instance. We yes. know that the insurance industry is in the gun at the moment. Mm. Yes. And to that extent, your role, if you're involved with it, you're in the gun in the same way. Right. How do you actually select beyond your immediate, beyond your, you have obviously particular talents and particular experience, but in the main, with a broad ranging portfolio of a large company or a large uh, non-profit even, mm. it, it, can, it can find itself in difficult areas. Mm. So how do you well, I certainly uh, would not accept the suggestion that you should take the first five or six that's offered to you. Mm. Um, I think you should be more um, uh, qualitative about your assessment, mm. think about the areas you want to get involved in, mm. examine the obviously the, the financial structure, the future economic potential of the um, organisation within its sector, mm. uh, who it reports to, uh, how its accountability works, mm. and the people involved too. And I think um, the people are important. Uh, the credibility of those that are uh, already on the board or in executive or key roles, I think that's important as well. Mm. That's all part of the examination and certainly, um, you know, I did that of any organisation. I, um, you know, I, I took a bit of time before mm. I accepted roles. And I think this is important and this is where I, I come to the, you know, mm. taking the first six. Often if you leave a role, vacancies don't just immediately come up in the timetable in which you leave. Vacancies occur over years when uh, people leave or move on and so you're sometimes better waiting for the right opportunity rather than just taking the first opportunity and I think that's very important because you can be succumbed into something thinking well there's nothing around the corner I won't mm. get another offer mm. there'll always be something else there if you make sure that you know what you want you um, you have good networks mm. you make it clear the sort of interests that you're involved in they will come up at a different timetable not just exactly when you leave so i'd have a, a sort of a contrary view to the view you expressed before in terms of uh, your state, uh, yep. Victoria, yep. Uh, it seems to have thrived yes. in your wake. Uh, mm. I'm sure you're happy to, to yes. for me to, say, to explain that view, but it seems to be the case that Victoria is uh, in a fortunate position which it has not had for decades that it would seem to have a leadership position, if you mm. like, as a regional uh, zone within Australia in terms of its employment, in terms of its uh, manufacturing, and it also has perhaps, uh, by historical uh, good fortune, lower rents, uh, lower prices. How, do, how does Victoria keep that position in the future? Well, um, it was a, a lot of effort over a lot of years by not just me, but several leaders in Victoria. Um, my predecessor, Jeff, Kenneth, my successor, John Brumby, who've had a continuity of policy. That is pushing strong population growth, which um, distinguished us from New South Wales. Our share of overseas migration compared to New South Wales increased. Our population growth, which reflected growth underneath the economy and demands for goods and services, increased. So relatively, even through the downturn, you saw 0.5 to 1% extra growth in Victoria, which led to lower unemployment mm. and stronger prospects, and eventually pulling in more share of graduates and skills into the state. And that's mm. important. And I think there's been a strong commitment um, that has been there through different leaderships. Uh, secondly, um, you know, looking to, uh, uh, to not just simply accept the the, the manufacturing base we have, but to enhance in advanced manufacturing those areas which will survive through advanced manufacturing design um, uh, as, as a part of what we do in the future. So we've seen a transformation, a big change from you know, a low grade manufacturer in white goods or textile or clothing or footwear to advanced manufacture in high grade design in advanced manufacturing in, in uh, um, high value engineering and that is our future. So there's been that transformation in the sort of substructure of the economy as well. But 
how would a state such as Victoria retain that leadership uh, position against rivals such as New South Wales in particular uh, going forward? Uh, to keep that going, um, it, it requires um, a significant investment by the government in research and development, a significant investment by the private sector as a result of that in research and development. So continuing on with the push for advanced um, medical discoveries in biotechnology and building on a strength we have. Looking at design in aeronautics, mm -hmm. in automotive, um, in, uh, in some of the, the fashion and design areas in, in the state. These are important and the governments can send a, a sign or a signal in that that they're supporting it as well, which you can do by arranging support mechanisms. I think it needs to continue. Um, as well, you know, there's something good in being second, the second biggest. Mm. You're a bit hungrier. Mm. You know, I can't tell you how many times organisations, internationally, companies, businesses came to me and said, you know, well, you seem to want us. Mm. You're not just assuming that we'll come as a default position, for example, to Sydney because, um, because that's what people know of Australia. You seem to be chasing it, you want it. Mm. You're actively in the marketplace talking about the attributes we have, skills, the cost base, um, a government which is supportive of the private sector. And I think that's important. Yes. So being second is not too bad. And I think, um, you know, it certainly hasn't hurt um, the automotive company VW. It probably hurt Toyota to become the biggest in the country. And we've seen mm. the results of that. Um, and certainly uh, to keep being hungry and not assuming by default that things will all automatically happen. A good example of that is the Future Fund. Yes. The Future Fund was going to Sydney. We argued strongly it should come to Melbourne. Mm. We worked with the then Howard government, particularly Peter Costello, the treasurer on it. Mm. Uh, we won that. Mm. We have to actively be in the marketplace to, to secure those sort of uh, um, opportunities for Victoria. Steve Brack, thanks very much for talking to Business Victoria. It's a pleasure.